Let's talk about GLP-1 agonists and how they work, plus some pharmacology. Here's everything we'll talk about in the video with timestamps down below and a short quiz at the end. Let's talk about GLP-1 agonists with a quick overview before we get into the details. The first thing is let's break down the word. We have GLP-1 agonist. GLP-1 is something that's produced in your body naturally that has a bunch of different effects that we'll talk about. It stands for glucagon-like peptide. That's not too important. Just know it's something your body naturally makes. And agonists mean they activate or they cause the effect. So here we have a drug that causes the effect of GLP-1. These drugs are primarily used in type 2 diabetes and they can also be used in weight loss. And anytime we talk about diabetes, we know our goal is to lower blood glucose levels, to lower that sugar level in your blood. It's also important to know how these drugs come. They're primarily injectable, and you actually inject it subcutaneously, meaning right under that cutaneous layer of the skin. But there is an exception, which we'll talk about, that is oral, but just know primarily they're injectable. And the last piece of information is that all GLP-1 agonists, they end in either glutide or tide. So the most popular one, we have semaglutide, and we also have exenatide. Now that we have somewhat of an overview of GLP-1 agonists, let's actually talk about how they work and what they do. So here, if you have a person that's eating a hamburger, what happens is that burger, the food, travels down your digestive system and eventually it'll go to your GI tract. And that burger is going to cause your body to release these things called incretins. Well, there's two we're going to focus on. And the first one you could have guessed is GLP-1. And then we have GIP. So these incretins cause various things to happen throughout the body. So when you eat, you have an increased level of GLP-1 and GIP. Well, these incretins can go to your pancreas and they can cause multiple things to happen. First, it can actually delay gastric emptying, meaning the food sits in your stomach a little bit longer. It can also increase the insulin production from your pancreas and the pancreas releases it through their beta cells. And these GLP-1 and GIP incretins can also decrease the actual glucagon that your liver makes. So we have multiple different things that these incretins can do. But overall, all three of these, they decrease blood glucose levels. So let's see what happens if a patient takes a GLP-1 agonist. So here we have semaglutide. Remember, it's a sub-Q injection. And instead of food triggering these incretins to increase, we're giving these incretins exogenously, meaning we're giving these incretins from the outside. So you don't need to eat that burger to get the GLP-1 or the GIP incretins. Instead, you're going to inject it and you have a direct increase in these levels. And then you're going to get everything else that we talked about, the delayed gastric emptying, the insulin, the decrease in glucagon. And keep in mind, for the weight loss side, delayed gastric emptying means you feel full longer, so you don't eat as much. And then the other two, increasing your insulin and decreasing glucagon, helps with blood sugar control. So these are how these drugs work. Now that we know how GLP-1s actually work in the body, let's talk about when we use them. Well, the first indication is type 2 diabetes. We kind of talked about it. It is not first line. We typically add on these medications as a second line or third line. Typically, first line is always reserved for metformin. And notice how we said type 2 diabetes. This medication is not used in type 1 diabetics. They're used in type 2 diabetics. The second thing we talked about again is weight loss. This medication got super popular over the last couple of years. This medication allows patients to lose weight because again, it slows the gastric emptying of food. It lets food sit in your stomach longer 
so you feel full longer. So now let's actually learn about the primary GLP-1 agonists that are on the market. So first, we have semaglutide. It goes by a bunch of different brand names. We have Ozempic, Wagovi, and then Rebelsis. I'm going to put an asterisk here. Rebelsis is actually an oral capsule, which is very unique. Remember, we said most of these GLP-1 agonists, they're injectable. Rebelsis is the only one that's oral. Here, it's usually a weekly injection. So it's 0.25 milligrams weekly for the first four weeks, and then we'll increase it to 0.5 weekly. And then you can slowly increase it up to a total of two milligrams weekly. Next, we have Xenotide or Bideron or Bayetta. Look at the difference here. It's five micrograms twice a day, up to 10 micrograms twice a day. Or you could use that extended version of two milligrams once weekly. So imagine you're injecting twice a day, and that's not really favorable when it comes to a patient's adherence. And then we have liraglutide, which is Victoza or Sixenda. This is a daily injection, 0.6 milligrams for one week, and then we can double it to 1.2 daily, and then up to 1.8 daily. And the last one we're going to outline is terzepatide or Manjaro or Z-Pound. This one's unique because it's both a GLP-1 agonist and a GIP agonist. So those in cretins, it will target both. And here, again, it's a weekly injection. You have 2.5 milligrams weekly for the first four weeks and then 5 milligrams weekly. And every week you can titrate it up to 15 milligrams weekly. Now, here's some caveats. You need to kind of know this. Anyone starting GLP-1 agonists will have some sort of GI issue. So they'll feel nauseous. They'll want to feel like they're vomiting. Because remember, it slows down gastric emptying. And when food sits in your stomach or intestines longer, you start feeling nauseous. You also need to know that some of these are dosed daily. Some are dosed weekly. It really does help to know which one's which to help guide therapy for patients. And the last thing I want to talk about here is kidney function. What's amazing is most of these drugs do not need renal adjustment, meaning you don't need to change the dose if a patient's kidneys are not functioning well, except for exenatide. So if a patient has kidney problems, exenatide is not your choice. And specifically, the label is do not use exenatide if the patient's GFR is less than 30. Now let's get into some of the side effects that we see in drug interactions. So the big one is nausea and GI upset. We've said this about three times now. When a patient takes it, they will experience nausea and GI upset. It does get better over time. They do get more tolerable by using the drug. Just warn the patient in advance, tell them that they're going to feel nauseous. And again, it depends on the patient. Some patients experience it more than others, but it's almost a guarantee that they're going to have some sort of GI upset. The second thing is weight loss. And you might be saying, oh, why is that a side effect? Well, if you're taking the medication for diabetes, technically the side effect is weight loss. The third thing to watch out for is hypoglycemia. So your blood sugar is dipping too low. And remember, these GLP-1 agonists help produce insulin through the pancreas. So it makes sense that you want to be careful to not have your glucose go down too much. The next side effect is going to be pancreatitis. This is super, super rare. We don't see it that often, but remember, it does affect the pancreas when we take a GLP-1, and this is just inflammation of the pancreas. The last thing here is a drug interaction. You do not want a patient to take a GLP-1 agonist and a DPP-4 inhibitor. For example, if a patient takes a GLP-1 agonist and they take a DPP-4 inhibitor like citagliptin, there'll be an extreme increase in GLP-1 activity because DPP-4 inhibitors, they're supposed to stop the breakdown of GLP. So if you're taking GLP-1 
and you're blocking the degradation or destruction of GLP-1, you're going to have such a high volume of GLP-1 in your bloodstream and in your body that you're going to have a larger side effect profile. And we don't want that. All right, we made it to the end. So let's do a quick summary and then a short quiz to see what we retained. We talked about GLP-1 agonists and how they're used in type 2 diabetes or weight loss. We talked about what happens when you eat a burger. It goes to your digestive system, and then you have these incretins release. And the two we talked about was GLP-1 and GIP. But instead of eating, we can take a GLP-1 agonist and inject it, which increases those levels even more, right? So we'll have even more GLP-1, even more GIP. And what does that do? Well, three major things. It delays that gastric emptying in your stomach. It increases your insulin through your pancreas. And it also decreases glucagon production. Overall, it decreases your blood glucose levels and helps with weight loss. Then we talked about the side effects. And the biggest one is nausea or upset stomach. We have weight loss, that hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, and that rare one, pancreatitis as well as a drug-drug interaction to not use these drugs with a DPP-4 inhibitor. So that's everything. Let's take a short quiz to see what we retained. Question one, which of the following is an indication for using GLP-1 agonists? Question two, which incretins does Ozempic increase? Question three, which side effect is most common when starting a GLP-1 agonist? Question four, which medication cannot be combined with semaglutide? 